everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today talking about forage, which plays a crucial role in Oklahoma's multi-billion dollar livestock industry. Research is underway on a new option. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Forage System Specialist, Dr. Alex Rocatelli. Cover crops are essential to many of the forage systems here in Oklahoma. Alex, you guys are doing some research into a crop that has been on the North American con continent before, but is being researched here in Oklahoma. Right, so we are researching tepary bean as a cover crop and also as a forage, or not, not why we can say both of them at the same time, right? So tepary beans, it's unbelievable when we would say about that, but this is originated here in southwestern United States, northwestern Mexico, around Arizona, New Mexico, border with Mexico. But that was important, imported, I'm sorry, uh, to Africa. And there they are producing beans, eating the beans, and also using uh, the forage, uh, what remains uh, to feed animals like cattle. So, and it worked pretty well there. You can see that it's a very leaf material, right? And we have also nice stems that's not very well lignified, that means less lignin, that means that it has a high digestibility. So uh, it looks like to be a very good candidate as a forage during uh, this time of the year that we know that we don't have much rain, Bermuda grass is doing not so good, alfalfa looks stressed, so that can be a saver for producers. This plant is actually, uh, it, it, it has a short growing season and, and can actually potentially be kind of wedged in between some of the winter crops. Exactly, exactly right. So believe it or not, we plant that uh, around June 21. What you are seeing here is growth of 55 days. Right. So that's what we got here. And right now, based on research that we had done in past, uh, I can assume that we have here about 2.5 tons per acre, I would say 5,000 pounds of forage per acre. And the crude protein of that right now, I would guess is around 20, 21%, and a TDN of 65 to 68. In other words, a very good forage. And we just come and prepare the seed bed on this area and that area also. And we planted, and look what we got with no herbicide use. Yeah. And if you just left the fallow without any management, look what we are getting there, right. right? So you can see that we really can have good growth with this plant and just with so far six inches of water. You, you, there, there's been research, some of your research partners that have worked with you in, in developing this for, uh, to, to get to this stage. So yeah. Uh, I had partnered uh, in the last years with the Grazing Lands Laboratory, Research Laboratory in El Reno. Right. And we had done research for two years and we found tremendous good results. Mm -hmm. And we just found out that this plant is very drought tolerant. And even more drought tolerant than other uh, legumes well known by being drought tolerant such right. as guar. And also being short cycle after we have all the last rainfalls during summer to put into the ground mm -hmm. and produce it about 30 to 50 percent more forage than other legumes. Right. So that's why I am putting my cards on this crop to study in future. And we hope that in next years we are going to have a management uh, developed for, for using this uh, cover forage here in Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Dr. Alex Rocatelli, forage system specialist here at Oklahoma State University. I'm Wesley and welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. We saw some beautiful sunny weather this past week, but some in the West would have gladly traded that in for a good rain. 
Soils are quickly drying up in areas that have missed out on recent precipitation. This map shows the weekly change in the 10-inch fractional water index as of the middle of the week. The browns show drying conditions and the greens show areas that have gotten wetter. Obviously, the browns dominate on this map. The actual index numbers at 10 inches show just where rain is most needed in the state. Remember, zero is the driest end of the scale and one is the wettest. The numbers in the red areas range from zero to 0.2. The green areas are in much better shape. It is the same story when we look at different depths. At 24 inches, much of the same western counties are showing up as red or less than 0.2. At a shallower level of 4 inches, it mirrors the 10-inch numbers. However, we start to see even more of the 0.0, .0 numbers indicating very dry conditions. Mesonet also has a 4-inch sensor under bare soil conditions. Surprisingly here, where no plants have transpired the moisture, the situation looks much better. Next up is Gary with the latest on the drought maps. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, the rains have slowed down a little bit, but we still got enough to alleviate some of those drought problems across the state. But unfortunately, other areas didn't get nearly enough, and we're starting to see some worsening in those other areas. Let's take a look at the latest drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, as you can see, still the same basic picture. We did get rid of the drought up in northeast Oklahoma. A little bit of the drought up in far northwest Oklahoma, basically uh, parts of Harper and Woodward counties. Um, we still have the moderate to severe drought scattered about the panhandle. And then we see another area of extreme drought, that's the red area, down in far southwest Oklahoma starting to encroach on our state from Texas. So that's the beginning area of uh, the worsening drought. So that's an area we're going to have to watch. It shows up pretty well on the uh, Mesonet 30-day rainfall map. We see those uh, wonderful areas of rains across parts of north central down into central Oklahoma and across parts of East Oklahoma, those are your yellows and reds and oranges, basically from four to eight inches, even a little bit more in some cases, uh, four to eight inches of rainfall, uh, nine, 10 over parts of uh, Eastern Oklahoma. But then we see down uh, across far Southwest Oklahoma, um, Altus only received uh, uh, 0.91 inches. So that's certainly a problem uh, that shows up once again, when we go to the percent of normal rain, fall map for the last 30 days from the Oklahoma Mesnet. Uh, again, down in southwest Oklahoma, uh, Jackson and Tillman counties, uh, less than half uh, normal rainfall for the last 30 days. So the rains have slowed down. If we look out into early next week, we see from the Climate Prediction Center, the outlook for the precipitation uh, does show increased odds of below normal precipitation across the entire state. So. We might not see many drought uh, monitor improvements as we get into uh, next week's map. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Many hunters have September 1st circled on their calendars, and it won't be long now. That's the opening day of dove season. Today, SUNUP's Curtis Hare learns about food plots, which are a popular way to attract doves to your land. At first glance, it appears to be just another burnt, barren field. But with a little closer look, you'll notice this land is essentially a five-star buffet for a popular game bird. So dove is actually the second most abundant bird in North America, over 300 million doves. It's a very common bird, uh, large bag limits. It's usually the first season that opens every year, so it's kind of a big tradition for people to think about going out in September. And, and, and hunting, it's a social event. The main thing you need to realize about dove is they're, they're, they eat grain. Whether it's soybean, millet, sunflower, or wheat, the main food source for dove is grain, and growing these crops to attract these birds and other game animals is a popular method in hunting. But the grain has to be available on relatively bare ground. They're not going to dig through vegetation. So not only do we have to produce the grain, but we have to manipulate the site in such a way that the dove can access it on pretty exposed surfaces. There are several ways to manipulate the plot for grain access. You can mow, burn, or do both. And in this particular wheat plot, the mowing and the burning works best, but it requires more effort. Uh, if you just burn, the seed doesn't necessarily shatter as much as you'd like, but you do have bare ground. 
If you just mow, the seed is very shattered and distributed, but you have a lot of litter. And in some places, the dove can't access the grain. This field will be ready for dove season next month. But getting to this point is a long process. You don't just come out, throw some seed in the ground, sit back and wait till summer to burn and mow. You have to manage the crop. So, so actually even before planting, it's really important to get out there and get a soil sample. Uh, irregardless of whether you're a farmer or a food plot manager, uh, the soil is an extremely important aspect of growing a good food source for whether it's livestock or, or, or wildlife. Really it is. Phosphorus is another critical nutrient because it establishes a good root. And we're wanting these plants to grow in some potentially marginal soil conditions and definitely some marginal environments because we may be without rain. So establishing a good root on that plant is really important. It's also important to manage wildlife during the growing season. Along with wheat, Dwayne and Brian also planted sorghum and sunflower in this field, but these crops didn't last long. Uh, but on this particular site, we have a really high deer density and the deer wipe the millet out, so we have no millet. Uh, also, the sunflower has been severely impacted. Soybean is another one that deer issues can be uh, really problematic on. So if you're planting any of those three, millet, and particularly sunflower and soybean, you need to think about planting very large acreages, at least five acres, but probably 10 acres or more. Once the crop matures, spraying it with glyphosate will help dry it down before the manipulation process. Although food plots require a lot of time and management, the returns are great for landowners and hunters. For every four or five ag producers I consult with, I consult with one uh, wildlife food lot plot, uh, either uh, an owner or leaser. You know, you don't have to plan anything, but certainly if you want to hunt with a large group of people, having a prepared field like this that has a lot of grain that you can draw doves in is really uh, beneficial to, uh, to get huge numbers of birds. For more information on managing food plots, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Curtis Hare. The unsung hero of the Oklahoma landscape is the pond. There are so many of them that we often don't take notice of them, but they do a lot for us. At last count, there were over 326,000 of them. We're the number one state in ponds per square mile in the entire country. Walk down any country lane or through any city park and you'll discover ponds. Ponds built for a variety of purposes. Beef cattle are vital to the economy of Oklahoma and water is vital to beef cattle. Overwhelmingly, cattle get their water from ponds. Even the most utilitarian pond can be managed for fishing, waterfowl, and wildlife if that's among your objectives and you devote time and energy towards that end. And don't overlook beauty. Look at any countryside scene and your eyes are immediately drawn to the water. You can't find a housing development being built without a pond. They're not just there to look good. They're primarily there to capture runoff and retain it and release it slowly to reduce downstream flooding. And we don't often think about it, but ponds are an important source of water for fighting wildfires and protecting homes, barns, and properties. Whether they're protecting us from floods and fires or feeding our bodies, souls, and pocketbooks, ponds are one of Oklahoma's most important resources. If you live in Oklahoma and you don't have access to a pond, you're underprivileged. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, why don't we kick things off looking at where the crop markets stand? Well, let's start with wheat. Uh, you go down south, Snyder area, around $4.15. If you come north up at Medford in that area, it's right at $4, maybe just a little above that. If you look at forward contracting out to the 21 crop, it's $4.42. We've had about a 25 cent increase in wheat prices over the last couple of weeks. You look at corn, uh, for forward contract, it's a, the basis is a minus 26 off that December contract. Price is around $3.16 a bushel, and we've had a 15 cent price increase in corn lately. Milo, now that's the story. Uh, that basis is 50 over. We got China in buying Milo, and that Milo price is $3.92 compared to 3.16 for corn. Boy, I wish I'd have raised Milo instead of corn this year. 
soybeans minus 75 cent basis. Uh, we've had about a 40 cent price increase in beans with a price somewhere around 840 and cotton has been flat at around 60 cents. Harvest is about to wrap up in the United States for hard red winter wheat. What is your take on the price outlook? Not very good. Uh, you look at the USDA, they're predicting an average annual price of $4.50 a bushel. The last five years, Oklahoma prices have averaged 32 cents a bushel below the USDA price. That puts our projected average annual price at $4.18. The pri average price in June was 426, July was 412, August is around 390. So the outlook is for, I think, slightly higher prices as we go out into the fall, but not very much movement in it. If you look out over the, say, the next five years, both the USDA and the, the Policy Institute, Research Institute at Missouri, project prices to be somewhere between $4.50 to $5 on the average for the next five years. What does this outlook maybe imply about production? Well, it, it implies that you've got to take a strong look at your cost of production and that there's some, there's some wheat fields that just don't need to be produced. If you can't produce wheat for $5 a bushel, and that's the top side of this, this forecast, then you need to be producing something else on that land. I think producers need to concentrate on cost, they need to concentrate on yields, and they need to concentrate on quality. What about the price outlooks for summer crops? Well, if you look at the uh, summer crops, uh, I think there's some potential in uh, corn and soybeans. China is the answer there. China's been buying beans lately. Uh, when they come in and buy corn, then we're gonna have a rally in, in prices, but it's totally in, and uh, completely dependent upon, I think, what China does. Some on the, on the corn crops in, southern, in the Southern Hemisphere and in Ukraine, but China the, is the big determinant of, of our price, and who knows what China's gonna do. If you look at cotton, cotton is lower production this year, lower ending stocks, but there's not, cotton prices just look flat until something happens. With all this in mind, what should farmers do to plan ahead? Well, I think they've got to take a strong look at how they're using their land. I know I've heard some landlords are saying that we're not going to, we're not going to do summer crops. We're going to go back to wheat. But if you go back to wheat, make sure you can uh, produce it for less than $5 a bushel. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. As we move through the month of August, we're obviously getting closer to uh, sale dates for calves that will be weaning this late summer and into the fall period. If you're one of those that is looking at the possibility of selling your springborn calves in a value-added calf sale, I really think you want to be paying close attention to uh, the weaning dates that will be required for those value-added calf sales. Most value-added calf sales will require that the calves be weaned a minimum of 45 days. And to some producers, they may wonder, why? Why do we have to have them weaned that long? Wouldn't a shorter time frame do just the same? Well, again, let's go back to the research and take a look. Iowa State did a study over a nine-year period of time, 2,000 head of calves that they had enrolled in, in one of their feedlot test programs and they monitored, among other things, how well the calves did depending upon how long they had been weaned before they were shipped to the feedlot. They basically broke the group down for statistical purposes into calves that had been weaned 30 days or less or longer than 30 days. What they found was those two groups had a substantial difference in health once they got to their destination. 28% of the calves that had been weaned less than 30 days showed some signs of sickness and had to be treated once they got to the feedlot. Less than half of that, 13% of the calves that had been weaned longer than 30 days was all that needed to be treated. But the story doesn't stop there. As they examined how many of these calves needed to have not only one, two, but three treatments in order to get over the disease, they found that those calves that were shipped less than 30 days 
There is 6% of those that required three treatments or more, where only 1% of the calves that were weaned after 30 days re required three or more treatments. In fact, uh, as they look back, those calves that were weaned less than 30 days had as many uh, treatments in order to get over whatever morbidity they had as did calves that were, were weaned on the trailer on the way to town. So I think you can see from this big data set that calves need to be weaned more than 30 days. So that's why that 45 is a real good number to assure that these calves are ready to go before they're shipped through the marketing system and on to either a wheat pasture or into a feedlot. That's why those buyers are willing to pay more, pay a premium for calves that have been through one of these VAC 45 programs. I encourage you to go to the SUNUP website, sunup.okstate.edu, look under show links. We've got a link there to the OQBN website and it's got all the sale dates and the corresponding weaning dates for those sales coming up this fall and other information to help you understand the value added calf program. I think that that's something that you want to consider as you're marketing those calves this fall. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Can't believe it, but Labor Day is almost here. And, and Daryl, that's usually traditionally the end of the summer grilling season. That's right. You know, uh, we think about this as kind of the end of summer beef demand. Um, and you know, we've we've uh, we, we've probably seen most of the buying for Labor Day passed at this point. We've had a nice run up in box beef prices over the last month, uh, and that's probably going to to top out or pull back just a little bit uh, as we go forward. What does that mean for fall demand? Well, fall beef demand means a transition to a different kind of demand, really. When you think about the product mix, as we get into the fall, uh, we'll see a little more demand. Cooler weather will bring on more interest in roast, crockpot cooking, that kind of thing. So we'll see some of those products begin to kick in. And actually, as we get more into the winter, that's, that's normally kind of prime time for restaurants. And so we see our steak demand kick up in the, in the fall or in the, in, in, yeah, as we go through the fall. And so, uh, you know, that one, that's one of the things we got to keep an eye on as we go forward. Food service obviously is still struggling, only slowly coming back online. And so if there's, uh, you know, that, that weakness there, or that slowness there may really translate into some more noticeable beef demand issues as we get into the fall. Now you were talking about demand there. We, we, we had quite a supply backlog earlier this year. Has, has, has that kind of leveled out yet? In terms of the fed cattle backlog, yeah, I think we're getting closer to the end of that, actually a little bit faster than I would have predicted at one point. Uh, the indications are we've seen a nice run up in fed cattle prices in the last uh, couple of three weeks. Um, you know, box beef going higher help that certainly, right. but overall the supplies are getting back more in line with that demand. And so, uh, you know, I think, we're, I think we're through the bulk of that and we can move to more kind of seasonal kind of behavior as we get into the fall. What what do you foretell the, uh, the, the, the fall looking like for cattle producers? You know, at this point, we're kind of seeing some optimism and I think, you know, justified optimism. Cow-calf producers in particular can kind of think about getting back to following through with your plans. Uh, these calf prices have increased a little bit this summer. Uh, the futures market would suggest they actually have the potential to go a little bit higher this fall, uh, at least uh, stay steady and not see the normal kind of seasonal decline. Right. And so, uh, you know, it, it probably won't be a banner year by any means, yeah. but it could be an okay year. Going forward, um, you know, if you look at uh, some of the stocker budgets for fall and winter, actually show some potential at this point, and that may mean that cow-calf producers also want to evaluate a retained ownership or a backgrounding kind of a, a thing. Uh, so I would say there's lots of op opportunities out there. Uh, there's lots of uncertainty still that could affect us, so you have to keep an eye on that and sort of stay nimble, but I think you proceed with plans kind of as, as you anticipated. Well, and on, on the back of that, we're getting ready for wheat planting. How, how, how do you think uh, that, that could impact cattle production as we move forward? 
Well, you know, certainly in the Southern Plains, when we see if we have a good fall, early fall planting season, then that will stimulate additional demand for those right. calves. So from a cow-calf standpoint, it may help do what I just said and, yeah. and support those calf prices into the fall. Uh, and again, uh, the budgets right now, based on the futures markets, uh, would suggest there's some potential there. So I think there will be some interest in that. Uh, and the conditions look somewhat favorable right now for getting that wheat planted. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Darrell Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Today, I thought I'd share a little bit of information about the creation of ready-to-eat breakfast cereal. Cole ready-to-eat breakfast cereal was invented in the United States by Dr. James Caleb Jackson. He opened the Jackson Sanatorium in Danceville, New York in 1859, where patients received counseling on how to live a healthy lifestyle. Additionally, Dr. Jackson served his patients specially formulated foods that he thought would promote health. One of these foods, created in 1863, was graham flour that had been mixed with water and baked into thick sheets, which were then broken into small pieces and baked again. This collection of small, brittle, rock-hard pieces was called granula, a food that had to be soaked overnight in milk before it could be eaten, and thus the first ready-to-eat breakfast cereal was born. However, Jackson was not alone in his quest to improve people's health. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was a surgeon, and like Jackson, was deeply into physical fitness. He served as the head doctor at the Medical and Surgical Sanatorium in Battle Creek, Michigan, where he also advised his patients on health and healthy lifestyles. It seems that he found inspiration in the work of Dr. Jackson and created his own ready-to-eat cereal. Thus, the second breakfast cereal was born. Unfortunately, Kellogg also decided to call his creation granula. Obviously, this didn't sit well with Jackson, who sued Kellogg and won. Kellogg then changed the name of his cereal to granola. So the next time you're enjoying that bowl of cereal on Saturday morning, remember to thank Dr. Jackson and Dr. Kellogg. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or fapc.biz. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. Thank you.